So let's talk about trauma. Trauma has been identified by many people in the past few years as one of the deep root causes of addictive tendencies. This was certainly true in my life and in 100% of the clients that I've worked with. So trauma is a constriction in your emotional functioning in, or in a person's emotional functioning where they actually become narrowed and constricted and harder. In other words, trauma is not what happened to you. Trauma is what happened inside you as a result of what happened. When I think about trauma and the work that I do nationally, we talk about trauma as being pervasive. Um, and we'll do a little bit of the prevalence information. Um, you'll see a lot of that tomorrow. Uh, but it is, it's pervasive. What we've discovered is 98% of the people who cross the threshold of a behavioral health organization, either with addictions or mental health challenges, have experienced significant trauma in their life at some point. If we do not look at trauma, we are not going to make a difference in this country in mental health, in addictions, and in primary care. And in my experience, we have trauma in many different ways. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual trauma, for example. Sometimes we have an experience that is deeply traumatic to us that might not seem or be traumatic to another person. For us to be wounded, it does not require something terrible to happen. So trauma does not have to involve something terrible happening to you. Usually when we think of trauma, we think of terrible things. And yeah, a lot of terrible things do happen to children. And I'm sure have to some people in this room, but it doesn't take that. It just needs your needs not being met for you to be wounded. I wanna share one that happened in my life that was so significant but again, many people wouldn't even identify it as trauma. When I was in kindergarten, we had recess and I had to put on my tennis shoes and tie them. I didn't know how to tie my shoes. And I actually remember, like it was yesterday, what it felt like to sit in the back of that classroom. I can actually remember to this day the aisle way, the desks, the teacher standing in front of the room. It felt like everyone else knew how to tie their shoes. And I sat there in total fear. The teacher, I'm assuming very well-meaning, sent me home with a board with two shoes glued to it. This is back in the day when we walked home from school. I remember carrying that board and walking down the sidewalk. I can remember this like it was yesterday too and I was reciting to myself over and over and over again, I am so stupid. I am so stupid. I am so stupid. And I remember that as a profound moment in my life because it was at that moment that I decided at a very deep level that I was stupid. That stayed with me all the way through school, and if I'm more honest with you, actually all the way up until right around the time I was 40 when I recognized that that was a false belief, not a reality. There's something about stories that just takes us there. So like, what is a story if not an account of something? And that accounting, that storytelling, we're all doing it all the time in our head. I mean, this is part of what it is to be human. You know, there's Eli Wiesel, he's the Holocaust survivor and a human rights activist and writer. He has this quote, he says, God created humans because God loves stories. We are like the way that story comes into the world. We are storytelling creatures, like fish live in the sea. We live in stories, the stories in here, the counts that we have of everything in our life. If we have a story that doesn't map well onto what is actually going on in life, Stories that we developed as a young child in really hard circumstances. Stories that don't serve us anymore. Stories that aren't even accurate anymore. Are we stuck with that? Is that our reality? As soon as we start recognizing that our stories are not reality, we become the storytellers of our own life. So imagine this adolescent who comes to see you and he or she can tell you what's going on in their lives and you express acceptance of them, and you express understanding and appreciation for who they are. You say, yeah, that's really hard. 
And then that person goes home into that same traumatizing situation. Okay? Now imagine that same adolescent who's experiencing the same trauma and every day has to go back to that same situation, but you're not in their lives. And there's nobody in their life to say, geez, that's hard, I'm so sorry, I get it. But you know what, it's not your fault. It's not you, you don't deserve it. Depending on when and where you grew up, you might have been told that it's not okay to feel. Or maybe in your family system, no one talked about emotions. That is emotional trauma. Anytime it is not honored and recognized that it's okay for us to feel, that can be emotional trauma. Trauma gives you pain. It, it gives you a wound that might, there might be some scar tissue over it, but the wound is never healed actually. So there's pain there. And then that's pain that you need to escape from. Trauma comes from a Greek word for wound, literally. So trauma is a wound. If I wounded you physically, if I stab you or slash your skin, that wound would heal by forming a scar. That scar tissue is going to be less flexible and less resilient than your natural tissue would be. There'd be a hardness there. There'd be a constriction there tightness. That's physical trauma. Same with emotional trauma. So where you were wounded, there's a scar there, which is harder to penetrate. It's less resilient. It's, it's tighter. It's constricted. This is a, a recording device, and it records everything that we've ever experienced. And it reacts to what we've experienced in the way that it reacted in the past. And so that's how we, we live the past. Now, so new circumstances arise, but we carry this old programming. In the East, they call that karma. So karma isn't what happens to you. Karma comes from you. Karma is the emergence in the present moment of all that past programming that meets a present moment circumstance. So how do you change that? Well, you've got to get a perspective on your perspective and people can and do get better if they learn how to meditate skillfully and they learn how to explore their past programming and deconstruct that past programming and construct new ideas and conceptions of self. So healing trauma is really about creating a safe space internally to begin to become aware of what's happening, not outside of us, but inside of us and look at the possibility that we can actually be present with ourselves enough to actually heal this trauma. In other words, we can't go back and change the past, but we can change our experience of the past and we can begin to become aware of how we can be present with ourselves here and now rather than getting pulled back the seduction of the past trauma can pull us back there. So we're going to learn how to be really present and create the internal safety necessary for us to start to actually heal the traumatic experience.